Friends, today we're turning in the Word of God in the New Testament to the Gospel of Mark. The second Gospel, Mark chapter 14. And we're going to uh, start the reading from verse 22. Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. Mark 14, verse 22. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, truly I say to you, I will no longer eat, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. We know God will bless the reading of his word to our hearts today. We need to remember, friends, that the acts of Jesus are as significant as his words, especially those acts in the upper room while handling the symbols of his own body, the emblems of his own body and blood, the evening before the crucifixion. As a dying man, here, Jesus calls his friends together while he makes his last will and testament. To give him a, a title to this today, thinking about it, simply this, meaningful symbols. Emblems which really mean something. Meaningful symbols. And this is what communion is all about, my friend. We're to remember, and we do it through these symbols. And there are two very clear and simple main points today in the message I'm bringing to you. Because in the reading, first of all, we see the bread as a symbol of his body. As a symbol. It's an emblem. It's a symbol. It represents something. And the bread that it, it represents his body. Verse 22. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread. He blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body the bread as a symbol of his body. Now, the symbol here is beautiful because bread is not needed more than the sufferings of Christ for the life and salvation of man. John 6 and 35, Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, when Jesus said that, of course, he was speaking symbolically. Jesus did not believe in cannibalism. Jesus did not say, come and you know, rip part of my flesh and eat it. Of course he didn't, as some people might think. No, it was symbolic because the, his body was symbolized by the bread. His blood symbolized by the cup. But Jesus was saying something much deeper here. He was saying, unless you partake of me and receive from me forgiveness and everlasting life, he says, you have no life in you. You need to come and partake of me. And so we see the bread here as a symbol of his body. And there are four things he did with the bread. Notice this. First of all, it says in verse 22, he took it. Notice that. He took it. We need to remember, friends, that this was Jesus' own voluntary act. He took upon himself, as the Bible says in Romans 8, verse 3, he took upon himself the likeness of human flesh. It does not say he took upon sinful flesh. He took upon the likeness of sinful flesh. And in taking upon himself a visible, physical body, Jesus was taking that which was to be for the life of the world. 
And this he did, as we know, of course, at his incarnation, when God became flesh and lived amongst us. This was a humbling but God-glorifying act. Think of it. The God of all glory. And he comes and is born of a woman. A woman he'd created and born as a baby. He took the bread. John 6 and 51. Jesus had been speaking to the Jews and the, and the religious leaders standing there. And he was speaking to them. And they were saying, oh, listen, we don't need to talk to you. We have Moses, his law. In fact, we've got Abraham as our father and Moses. He gave us the law. What else do we need? And we've got all this. And besides that, in the wilderness, Moses and, and God took care of us and we're fine. And they boasted about how that they were descended from Abraham. They had Moses to teach them. And therefore, they had no one else to teach them. And Jesus picked up on this in John 6 and 51. And he said, listen, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. They've been boasting about that God fell, fed the people of Israel in the wilderness and the desert bread supernaturally from heaven. And they thought this was wonderful. They thought it's because they were so special. And Jesus says, listen, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Again, he's speaking symbolically. He goes on to say, and if anyone eats of this bread, speaking of himself, if anyone eats of this bread, that person will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the whole world. In fact, just before this, Jesus said, yeah, the, the bread you're speaking about that you were fed by in the wilderness, the manna from heaven, all those that ate it, by the way, P.S., they're all dead. They're all dead. But I'm the living bread which came, that comes down from heaven, and whoever eats of me, you shall have everlasting life. There's a big difference. And so first of all, in the bread as a symbol of his body, we see then that Jesus took it at the Last Supper. But not only did Jesus take the bread, but secondly, he took it and then he blessed it. Because in the taking of that bread, he sanctified and made it holy. That means he set it apart. It doesn't mean it became something else. It doesn't mean suddenly it's a special supernatural piece of bread. No. What it means is, is that he set it apart because they're going to partake of it because it symbolized his body. That's what it was important. It symbolized, it was an emblem, a representation of his body. And that's why he blessed it, because this was something important that they needed to know. It wasn't just a piece of bread they were having, it's what it represented, which was so important. His body, remember, his physical body, being born into this world, taken on human flesh. His body became, and it was a holy thing. And his body, remember, was qualified to be offered as a sacrifice to God at the cross. Because he who knew no sin became sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God. You see, Christ's body was blessed by the holy indwelling spirit of God and a life of blameless service to God. Blessed with infinite blessing. He blessed it. He blessed the bread. In fact, in Hebrews 10 and 5, we read there that when Jesus came into the world, he said, and he's speaking to his father, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. God prepared a body for a son to have when he came into the world, born in likeness of sinful flesh, took on human form. And the Bible says that body was prepared by him. Why? So that very same body would be nailed to a cross. This was all prepared by the Lord. The bread is a symbol of his body. He took the bread he blessed it. Thirdly, he broke it. This also, friends, we need to remember, was his own doing. Even though with wicked hands they crucified him, 
Yet he could say in John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, he declared, I lay down my life that I might take it again. Notice that. I lay down my life that I might take it again. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Some people may say, well, hold on a minute. You don't need any power, you know, to, to lay your life down, to get killed. You don't need any power. When you are the eternal Son of God, and when you are the giver of eternal life, and that all creation hangs on your word, yes, that is an amazing thing. You need power to let down. Jesus had power to let down because no one could take his life from him. He was almighty God and still is. And the Bible says he broke it. 1 Corinthians 11 and 24, Paul in the same theme says there and, and records the words of Jesus. It was revealed to Paul Christ said, this is my body which is broken for you. Which is broken, not just broken, but broken for you. So what does that mean? What's important about that? Because this teaching of substitution is clearly taught here. What do I mean? Jesus took your place and my place on the cross. If Jesus simply died on the cross and that was it, then all he was was a martyr to whatever he was following and to whatever he uh, spoke about. But the fact was we see perfect substitution that he was God's perfect lamb who died in our place upon that cross and gave his life a ransom for many. And so we see that he gave his life. The body and the bread Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. He was saying it to his disciples. He says to all those who trust in him today, and he says to all those, he says, listen, I died for you. I died in your place. You should have died, but I died in place of you because I love you, and I want to see your sins forgiven and see you have received the gift of eternal life. You see, friends, the breaking of his body was by his own willing consent. This gives additional virtue to his sacrifice. All that happened to God's Son on the cross was allowed to happen by divine power. Jesus let them do those things to him. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, when some of the disciples were there and Peter was there and remember the, the troops came to arrest Jesus and Peter stepped forward. He took a sword and he sliced off the high priest servant ear, his right ear, his name was Malchus. And Jesus picked up the ear and put it on his head and healed him. Jesus healed him at that point. And Jesus said, Peter, Put your sword up. Put your sword back into its scabbard. He said, do you not realize? He says, at this very moment, I could call 12 legions of angels and they could come and set me free. In fact, here's a better thing. Jesus, in fact, didn't even need 12 legions of angels. All he had to do was speak the word and the enemies could have been wiped out in a second. But Jesus allowed all these things to take place. Why? Because of his love for you and for me. Because he wouldn't let anything stop him from going to the cross because this was the only means that you and I could be saved by his death on the cross. And so Jesus was not going to let anything get in the way. And so he allowed himself to be treated in such a way. And he went to the cross willingly. And so the, the, the bread is a token, a symbol of his body. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. That's why the prophet Isaiah writes in Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5. And he's writing as if this has already happened. It's prophetic, but it's almost as if this Messiah had already died. And this is how Isaiah writes it. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him 
That means we reckoned him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He said we esteemed him and reckoned him struck down by God and afflicted. What Isaiah was saying, we reckon, we thought, well, obviously he deserves this from God. He's being punished by God. But then Isaiah says these words immediately. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. In the Hebrew, it's he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And he did that because he loved us and he cared for us. The bread is a symbol of his body. He took the bread. He blessed it. He broke it. And fourthly, what did he do then? He gave it. Notice that. Verse 22. He gave it to the disciples. You see, in giving the broken bread to his believing disciples, Jesus therefore indicated that the imparting of the saving virtue of his broken body, it's in his own hands. It's all in his own hands, friends. Nothing was taken from him. It was all in his hands. And he freely gave it to them. Notice, the Bible says in Galatians 1 and 4 that Jesus gave himself for our sins. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all. Titus 2, 13 and 14, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. No one else delivered Jesus up. He did it himself. The Apostle Paul was able to write in his letter to the Galatians, in chapter 2, verse 20, he spoke of Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. And again, Jesus said in John chapter 10, this time verses 27 and 28, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. No one else does. I give them eternal life. You find the scripture in this point. Apostle Peter, Peter was standing. And he was preaching in Acts 4 and 12. And he was preaching about Jesus. They told him, stop preaching in that name. He said, listen, nor is there salvation in any other, because there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's only one name, there's only one way, there's only one Savior, and His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. And thank God, He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we see the bread as a symbol of His body. He took it, He blessed it, He broke it, He gave it. But then secondly, then we see the cup as a symbol of His blood. Look at verse 23. Then Jesus took the cup, and when He had given thanks, He gave it to them, and they all drank from it. The cup as a symbol of his blood. We need to remember, friends, all the way back from the Old Testament, Leviticus 17, verse 11, the Bible states, listen carefully to this, the life of the flesh is in the blood. We need to remember that. If it was possible, if you were to take a body, I'm not asking you to do this, Take a human body and drain all the blood out of it. That human will cease to live. Because the, the life of the flesh is in the blood. The flesh needs the blood to survive. And it goes on to say, it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. If Jesus had simply died on the cross, there was no shedding of his blood, you and I, if we put our trust in Jesus, we'd be going to a lost eternity. The cross would have been an absolute waste of time. But the life of the flesh is in the blood, and it's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Again, in our prophetic chapter of Isaiah 53, we read in verse 12 of Jesus, the Messiah, He poured out His soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Notice that. Very importantly, in pouring out his blood, he was pouring out his soul unto death. 
He was pouring out his soul unto death because he was pouring out his blood. The cup as a symbol of his blood. Four things on the cup as a symbol of his blood in verse 23. First of all, again, this time Jesus took the cup. Think about it. The cup of sorrow and suffering was put into his hand by his loving and righteous father. He took the cup. He knew exactly what it meant. The disciples didn't fully understand. They just thought this was part of the last su- of the supper, but it was his last supper. They didn't fully understand. In fact, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane would have been a little while after this. The disciples were sleeping in the garden. Jesus went us about a stone's throw away, knelt down and prayed. In Matthew 26 and 39, we read part of his prayer. Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Notice that. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. In spite of all this, Father, it's not what I want, it's what you want. He said, let this cup pass from me. Why did he pray that? Because remember, Jesus was fully God and fully man. And also he had the feelings of man as well. And he was facing this horrendous death. And he realized it's going to be very, very hard for him. But he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup, this cup of suffering pass from me. You see, friends, what it all meant, you and I cannot tell. What it all really meant in the cup, we cannot tell. Because we cannot fathom such depths of the mind of God. But one thing's for sure, this cup, this cup of suffering, meant infinitely more to Christ than it can mean to you and I. In Hebrews 2 and 9, we read, the writer says, that Jesus, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. This is what it's all about, friends. That he might taste death for everyone. He took the cup. Not only did he take the cup, but then it says he gave thanks for the cup. Now, to use a a biblical word here from the Psalms, I need to use the word selah. Because I just said he gave thanks for the cup. Selah. I mean, hold on, take time out. Let's pause. Let's think. Let's meditate about this for a few moments. He gave thanks for this cup of suffering, knowing what it meant. He gave thanks for it. He gave thanks for the cup that was his own appointed symbol and emblem of his agony and his awful death. Think of the depths of his mercy and grace. He was thanking his father for the privilege of suffering and dying in place of the sinner. That's you and me. Friends, what love, what grace, what mercy. He gave thanks for this cup. And in 1 John 4 and 10, John writes, In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He sent his son to be the special sacrifice for our sins on the cross. He sent his son to be the mercy seat for our sins. Psalm 103, verse 2, David declares, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Surely today we can say that in light of Christ's wonderful offering of himself. Surely we can say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, all the benefits that came with his suffering and death at the cross. He took the cup. He gave thanks for it. Thirdly, he gave it to them. He gave the cup to them. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 and 25 because it was revealed to Paul supernaturally about the upper room. What happened there? And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 and 25 that it was after supper that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. After his atoning death, 
comes the gift of life. Hallelujah. The giving of the cup. This is important, friends. The giving of the cup by Jesus also suggests his desire that you and I, along with the disciples as God's people, according to Philippians 3 verse 10, we should enter into the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. He gave it to them so that we too could be part of this. Not part of the sacrifice, because only one could give his life for the sins of the world. That was God's Lamb, Jesus. But that we could enter into his sufferings afterwards and realize what it cost and what it, the price that Jesus paid in order to procure our salvation, to really understand in some way, in some measure. Jesus gave the cup to them. He took the cup. He gave thanks for it. He gave it to them. And fourthly, they all drank from it. You see, friends, to drink of this cup also means according to 2 Corinthians 4 and 10, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested and revealed in our body. So wrote the Apostle Paul. They all drank from it. And that's why Paul stated in Galatians 2 and 20, when he said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Now, of course, again, Peter here is speaking symbolically. Peter didn't die on the cross next to Jesus. Of course he didn't. Jesus was crucified between two thieves. What does Paul mean then? Paul was meaning that when he put his trust in Jesus and when he gave his life to Christ, he said, Lord, you died for me on the cross. And Lord, I believe that you died my death, which I deserve. And the moment that Paul did that, then he was able to say, I have been crucified with Christ. My old life was crucified with Jesus on the cross so that when my old life is crucified and it's, and it's judged there at the cross of Calvary, then Jesus sets me free and gives me not only forgiveness of sins, which is wonderful, but also everlasting life. And that's what Paul meant when he said, I have been crucified with Christ. And then immediately he says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Christ living in us. And friends, when you put your trust in Jesus, his life, by the power of his Holy Spirit, lives within you. And very often, down through the years, I've heard people say, well, you know, I would love to do this, but you know, I, I won't be able to keep it up. And that's the first true thing you've probably said when you come to Christ. Because you'll never be able to keep it up. You'll never be able to live the life of Christ by your strength. But here's the good news. He's the one that keeps it up. He's the one that lives that life within you. You simply surrender to him. You simply agree with him. Say, Lord, live out your life in me. And he will do that very thing. And as Paul said, it's no longer I who am living. It's Christ living within me. And friends, what a wonderful thing that is. Because the old life, when you put your trust in Jesus, it's gone. Because it's nailed to the cross with Jesus. And you never have to remember about that. The wonderful thing is, is that trusting in Christ, it's him living out his life through you. The cup as a symbol of his blood. He took the cup. He gave thanks for it. He gave it to them. And they all drank from it. So friends, we see meaningful symbols. The bread as a symbol of his body. The cup as a symbol of his blood. And friends, in observing the Lord's Supper this morning, as God's people, we're not called upon to remember him as a teacher, as a rabbi, nor are we called upon to remember him merely as an example, as many churches do in Christendom. No, no. We are called upon to remember Jesus as our sacrifice. To proclaim the Lord's death 
till he come. Notice that. Notice how the word of God is so clear here. Until he comes again, we're to proclaim the Lord's death. Why? Because it's only through his death that our sins can be washed away by the blood that he shed and we can receive everlasting life. It's only through his death. No other means. There's only one way and by one means. It's through Jesus. Verse 24 of our reading. Jesus said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Luke 22 verse 17. Then Jesus took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. Notice that. Took the cup, gave thanks and said, Take this, take this cup and divide it among yourselves. Each of you drink from it. What was that meaning? Jesus was saying in a sense, take this great atoning work and divide it among yourselves because there is more than enough to go around. Hallelujah. There's more than enough. It's not limited. Oh, we've run out. Let me tell you, friend, today, Jesus will never run out of forgiveness before he comes. He will never run out of grace he will never run out, as it were, symbolically of the blood that he shed to wash away your sins. He'll never run out of that. There'll always be plenty, plenty, for plenty of people to call upon him to be saved. And if you're here this morning, friend, you've never asked Christ to come into your life, you can, because there's plenty to go around. There's coming a day soon, but it will stop. It'll be no more, no more grace. No more forgiveness. But right now, the door to heaven is open. His name is Jesus. His name is Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. And he's here right now, in the person of his Holy Spirit. And all you need to do, but it's so important, it's so vital, is trust in his son, Jesus. And he is the one who take away your sins and give you eternal life. Friends, the moment you call upon him, the moment he'll save you from your sins. It's important, my friend. In a few moments, we will be partaking of communion. We'll be doing that. But you know, if, if you're not a Christian, you've never given your life to Jesus, partaking of the emblems, that which represents his body, uh, and the juice which represents his blood, you can partake of that. It'll mean nothing. It, it'll, it'll mean nothing because you don't know Jesus. But furthermore, there's also a warning to Christian believers because the Bible says that before you partake, you've got to examine yourself. In fact, there's a, a greater warning to the believer than there is to the non-believer. In other words, if there's sin in your life, child of God, Christian believer, there's sin in your life, what do I mean by that? Because we're all sinners, we know that. What I mean by sin in your life, because you know there's something you're doing in your life right now as a Christian, and you know it's wrong. But you won't stop it. You won't give it up. You say, I'm not going to stop it. I'm going to keep on doing it. I'm enjoying it. And the Bible says if you do that, and if you partake of the Lord's Supper, then what you do is you eat and drink judgment to yourself. That's to the Christian believer. So the Word of God says, graciously and mercifully, examine yourself. In other words, get yourself sorted out with the Lord before you partake of the Lord's table. So child of God, let's make sure today that there's nothing between us and the Lord. Let's make sure that we're right before the Lord. And then as the Bible says, then we partake in a worthy manner, which does bring discernment and blessing to the Lord's body. But friends, let's remember. We're going to be remembering Christ's death. It's a wonderful thing to do. We remember his death. Of all that he did, but we need to remember this as well. Jesus is not dead. He's alive forevermore. And he's coming back soon. You know, friend, it's simple, it's childlike, 
what I'm going to say. I know he's alive. I only spoke with him this morning. He's coming back soon. The word of God says, we're to eat and drink as a testimony unto him. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you that you sent your son into the world. We thank you that he came willingly. And he willingly went all the way to the cross of Calvary and gave his life. So that, Lord, there's that wonderful opportunity that we can know our sins forgiven and to know everlasting life. Father, we ask your blessing to continue upon your word. Lord, speak to all of our hearts. And we pray in the name of Jesus, that Lord, in a few moments when we come to communion, as we remember what your death was all about, what it really meant, and what it means to us now, and what it will mean for all eternity, Help us to do it properly, genuinely, and to do it with the love in our hearts towards you. And we'll bring all the praise and glory to you. These things we ask in Jesus' name, and everybody says. Thank you for listening so well, friends. Before we come to communion, we're going to sing a, a song together to prepare our hearts. And also just to Let's get our emblems, our symbols prepared. Just peel off the top film. Little, little biscuit represents his broken body for us. Jesus said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do it in remembrance of me. Let's remember. The same way also Jesus took the cup after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Let's do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's remember. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible states to the, the believers, to the church, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Of course, we only have communion until he comes. When Jesus comes again, we'll have the real thing. We we'll have to remember him through symbols. We'll have the real Savior. And we're looking forward to that day. Praise the Lord.